Welcome, and today we are going to talk about the op-amp configuration of inverting and non-inverting amplification. So inverting and non-inverting amplifiers. And so we've been talking about voltage followers and the normal configuration of op-amps, but now we're gonna use them in probably one of the most common ways they're used besides, besides the voltage follower. And that's where you have an input and then you say, I, I want it to be this much bigger or sometimes smaller, depending on how you want to do it. So before we get into the configurations of the inverting and non-inverting, I want to talk about the inverting and non-inverting inputs to the op amp. And I'm sorry for that name confusion, but let's jump into that really quick. So up until this point, whenever I've talked about the inputs to the op amp, I've just called them V plus, V minus, the positive input, the negative input, stuff like that. Another way to describe them that's probably much more helpful and understanding intuitively of what's going on is you have your non-inverting input and your inverting input, which your positive is your non-inverting and your negative is your inverting. So what that means is that when you have a higher voltage on your positive or your non-inverting input, then you have a high voltage coming out of your output. Whereas if you have a higher voltage on your inverting or your V negative to your op amp, then you get a negative voltage on the outside. And the reason it's doing this is because again, your output is almost always attached to one of the inputs and it's trying to drive those inputs so that they have the same voltage. So that's the behavior. If you were to just use this and not connect the uh, output to the input and you were to put a higher voltage here and uh, instead of your non-inverting, then you will have a very high voltage here. And since op amps technically have an infinite gain, if your positive non-inverting input is even a little bit higher than your negative, then your output will be as high as it can be in the positive range. Whereas if you have the same thing where your inverting input has a higher voltage than your non-inverting input, then the output will be as negative as your op amp is capable of because it will want to amplify that difference as much as possible. Okay, let's see if that made sense. I'm gonna go over that really quick once again. So your non-inverting or positive input, if it is a higher voltage than your inverting or negative input, then your output is going to be positive. If your inverting or negative input is higher voltage than your non-inverting or positive voltage, then your output is going to be negative. Okay, are we good to go? Hope so. Awesome, with that, now let's talk about how we can set this up to work as an amplifier. Now, strangely, well, strangely at first, you get the inverting amplifier configuration much more often than you get the non-inverting, so we will start with that. Okay, so here we have the inverting op-amp configuration, and we have our VN going through RN, RF for feedback, and then to output, we have our non-inverting or positive input tied to ground, and then we just have our output here. Now, if you don't need anything else, you can just look at this and say, hey, other people have derived what my in and out equation will be, and it is simply that V out over V in, which sometimes is just called A for amplification factor, or something like that, equals negative RF over RN. And that negative is where this is inverting. So it will amplify the signal and invert it to make it negative. So let's take a moment and go through it and see where this comes from. It's very, very simple. Again, most op-amp circuits are very easy to deal with. So let's talk about that. So hopefully by going through this process, you get a better intuitive feel of what's going on with this inverting amplifier. As always, we remember that these two have the same voltage and there is no current into the inputs. So we know that right here, that is at zero volts and that the current through Rn and Rf is the same. And using that, we can very quickly derive this formula, which I hate the word derive. I've always hated derivations, so don't get scared by that. If I'm okay with it, you're probably gonna be okay with it. So let's just say we've got this current right here. That's the same as this current right here. So we can say the current through Rn is simply going to be Vn minus zero, because that's zero volts, over Rn. And then we know that's the same as this, so we can actually go here and we can do that is equal to zero minus V out over RF, our feedback. And again, we know those are the same because this is just describing the current going through there and this is describing the current going there. 
zero minus V out gives us current flowing in that direction. So we're already very straightforward. We can get rid of those zeros because they're not needed. Don't get rid of that negative because that is needed. And now all we have to do is put it into the V out over V in format. So let's take RF and multiply it on both sides and then take V in and divide it on both sides. So we put RF up there, RF over R in equals negative V out over V in. And then we just multiply that by negative to get that negative on the other side. But just again, so you don't miss that step, I basically took R, multiplied both sides by RF and divided both sides by R V in. And so that moved up there and that moved down there. And that just gives us V out over V in equals negative R F over R in. See? Very, very simple derivation. So that is, that's it. But if you don't want to have to do this every single time, again, you can find this equation everywhere. It's on our website, it's on other people's websites, it's in books, it's everywhere. Very, very common. Now to give you an idea of what would happen, so if we have this, so if you have V in as one volt, you have RF as 10,000 ohms, and you have R in as 1,000 ohms, then your output is going to be negative 10 volts because you have um, negative 10,000 over 1,000 gives you negative 10. So that multiplied by V in of one volt will give you your V out of negative 10 volts. And that's, that's all it is. That works both on DC and AC circuits. So if you have a normal AC circuit or DC circuit in, if you put in one volt, you'll get 10 volts out. If you have a square wave, especially one that's circling um, or bouncing uh, positive and negative, you're gonna get an inverse and an amplification. So that'll be pretty exciting. But that is it. This is very, very common, very simple. It's an easy way to get exactly what you want. If you need a lot of precision, then you need just need very precise resistors right here for your RF and RN to get exactly what you want. But with that, I think that's everything we need to know about inverting. Let's do the non-inverting and then do a really quick practical example of a non-inverting circuit. Now with non-inverting, you'll notice that your input goes directly into the non-inverting input and then your output uses a voltage divider that is connected to your inverting output. So on the other one, on the inverting, we had R in and R feedback, but since this is slightly different, it doesn't do feedback the same way. The seems like most people do R1 and R2. If you want to, honestly, it's all just a name, whatever keeps it straight in your brain. But I'm using R1 and R2, and I just wanted to point that out just in case you're like, wait, why, why did you use RN and RF last time? Eh, it's just standard. Anyway, so with this, our output is not going to be a negative output. It is going to be a positive output, but it's going to be a little bit more complicated because instead of just having a direct amplification, well, RF over R, RF over RN to get your amplification, you have this one factor. So this is, again, the equation that describes the output that you're going to get, V out over V in, which again could be described as A, your amplification factor, equals one plus R2 over R1. So in this case, if you had R2 as 10,000 and R1 as 1,000, your amplification factor would be 11, positive. So if you put in one volt, you'd get 11 volts, positive 11 volts out. So uh, just like with the last one, let's go over how we get this. And again, it's very, very simple because we can make those same assumptions. This and this are going to be the same voltage and there is not gonna be any current through there. So we know that the current through R1 and R2 is the same. Now with that, we can establish that this voltage is V in and then we can just write those two together. So let's assume a direction. We will assume that the current goes this way, and which also means this way, because that makes sense. You typically have things going to ground unless V out's negative, but we'll, we'll just make that assumption. So here we have V out minus V in over R2 equals this current being V in minus zero over R1. 
Okay, and now it's just a matter of, again, making it V out over V in to get us into this format. So let us multiply R2 over that side and divide it by V in over here, and then we will get V out minus V in over V in equals R2 over R1. Now, since this is just subtraction, we can divide this so it's V out over V in minus V in over V in. So let's write that down here. I'm running out of space. So V out over V in minus V in over V in, which obviously goes to one. That will give us, okay, I'm gonna do a gives us instead of V out over V in minus one which then makes it, man, I'm, I'm doing more steps than is absolutely necessary here. But basically, V out over V in equals, adding one to si both sides, one plus R2 over R1. Whew, okay. Have all this space over here. I, I did not use my space very wisely, but hopefully that, that shows you how this is related mathematically. And again, it's pretty straightforward as long as you remember that there's no current into the inputs and you can make that assumption that these are the same voltage. It's very, very simple circuit analysis to derive these. But you don't need to derive them all, all the time. As long as you understand it, just go look it up if you don't remember off the top of your head. If it's been like three years since you've done this, you're like, what was that again? Just go look it up. It's fine. You understand it intuitively. But it is really important to understand this so you can work with it. Okay, now with this, I put together a non-inverting circuit so we can just see it in action. It's not going to show anything surprising. And I have used 2,000 ohms for my R2 and 1,000 ohms for my R1. So with that, I'm expecting my, out, my amplification factor be, to be 1 plus 2 over 1, so 3. So let me get that set up again really quick. We will go over it and then we'll wrap this up because you should now have a pretty good understanding of how inverting and non-inverting op-amp circuits work. All right, hopefully this is nice and visible, but this is the same op-amp that we used for the voltage follower example. So this is a dual op-amp, and so we don't really use anything on this side because that's the other op-amp in the circuit. We have our negative power input and our positive power input, basically VCC and ground, even though this is at 14 volts and this is connected to ground. Here we have our input, and then on the next one, so this is our Invert, non-inverting input, excuse me, our V positive here, and then up here we have our, not, excuse me, our inverting input, which we have both of these two resistors connected to. One of them is going to the output right there, and that that is the multimeter is connected right here to that output, and then the other resistor is going to ground to create that voltage divider that we just discussed. So, using our input, we should be seeing an amplification factor of 3 on our output. All right, so let's go look at our power supply and our multimeter to see how this all works. Okay, so here I have my power supply, and this is that power supply I was talking about, so the 0 to 14 volts, and then this is my voltage in, uh, so the V in to my non-inverting op-amp circuit. As you can see up here, with 2 volts in, I am getting 6, 6.2-ish, 6 6-ish 6 volts out, which is exactly what we'd expect. And then as we adjust this, there we go. And now we see the 3 volts on the output. That was a little bit of a delay, but again, you can see that amplification factor of 3. And then we can even go the other way, up to 3 volts, and now we're at about 9. So that's exactly how it works. And again, this works with with basically anything, both a DC and an AC circuit. But whatever our voltage in, our voltage out is simply 3. Now, imagine we want to go up to 5. Let's see what happens. Oh, hey, we can't go anymore because we're saturated. And, in, and that is where the input changes. So we can actually change this. We can't go too much higher before we start to damage the um, op amp. But you can see that now we are being restricted by our input to the op amp, the power input. So that's something where you need to take into consideration when you're amplifying things, you still have to worry about your input to the op amp itself because eventually you're going to max out and you're going to start having problems.
And, and so that's it. It's pretty straightforward. You do still need to take into account, especially with AC circuits, your slew rate, your response time, uh, any sort of offset, any sort of other issues like that. But as long as you're providing sufficient power to your op amp, and that's both positive and negative. If you have an inverting op amp and you're not giving it a negative voltage with a reference to ground so that it can go to both sides, it's not gonna be able to do it. Even though when we're doing our homework and we're able to ignore the inputs a lot. In real life, that's a very real consideration. And for me, in my practical, limited, but practical experience, that has been my biggest problem of, oh, I need to make sure that my inputs to my power supplies for my op amps are correct. On paper, you don't need to worry about it. It's much, much easier. But in real life, those are things that you need to consider. Hopefully this was helpful with both inverting and non-inverting amplifiers and that you understand exactly, again, how powerful and simple these op amp circuits can be. If you liked the video, give it a like, subscribe to our channel, and we will catch you in the next one.